I'm here today um, to talk to you about how a very old, in fact an ancient mathematical problem, can be used to uh, design better materials today. And first I would like to acknowledge my, my collaborators. So Elizabeth Chen at Harvard University, who is a, the mathematician in this project. My colleagues at the University of Michigan, Michael Engel and Pablo Damasino and our advisor, Sharon Glotzer, at the University of Michigan as well, and of course my funding, which is a Marie Curie Fellowship. Okay, so here's uh, the first slide. Um, I have collected these, uh, these images, I have put them together here, and the reason why um, I'm showing them is because at first glance, uh, if we take a look at this, we, we notice that um, these are very diverse systems, these are very different objects, so, um, but they have something in common. So we have oranges, we have these are red blood cells, Pringles, uh, containers, uh, a suitcase, square watermelons, bottles, nanomaterials, and so on. But there's something that they all have in common. This is why I have put them up on this slide. And that is that what they show, what all these images show is how things fit together in space or in containers. So this is how um, things pack densely let's say, different objects packed densely. And, um, and there are two important things that I would like you to notice further. One is that there are many length scales. So down here, I'm showing uh, an image from nanomaterials. Uh, these are nanoparticles that pack together to form these structures. Um, up here on the microscales, we have red blood cells, uh, viral capsids, and then uh, on the bigger scales, we have oranges and containers and bottles and things like that. Also, this is the interior of the iPhone, right? So these are all different scales. And the other thing that is important is that, um, is that packing, these packing properties, how things fit together in space, is, is related to the property of, the, of your system. So what I mean by this is that, for example, if you look at these nanomaterials here, what we have is we have objects that pack together in a certain arrangement, and then this arrangement has certain properties. So this might mean, so different packing arrangements might mean that, uh, that a material can conduct electricity versus not conducting, or can let light go through versus not letting light go through. Um, up here, I'm showing red blood cells. This is not very clear on the image here, but basically these red blood cells look a bit like those Pringles. Um, they're like these platelets, and these are healthy blood cells. But it was shown very recently, actually, that, um, that when there is a blood clot in, in your body, red blood cells pack very differently, and they pack in this polyhedral sort of way. Um, so, so, so packing is also is related to function as well, to the properties of your system. And in the macro scales, of course, we always try to, to efficiently use space. So we, we try to pack things as much as possible. IKEA has built an empire in packing as much as possible inside a box and shipping to the other side of the, of the planet. Uh, because it's efficient, you can save money by doing this, by packing as many oranges as you can in a box. OK, so, so the idea here is that, is that packing is relevant at all scales, and it's important, and it has impro important properties. But you might imagine that efficiently using space is a very old problem, and you would be right. So this is actually, this is actually an ancient problem. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about, uh, ab about a sort of packing story. So, um, so what dense packings do we know? Let's take, let's take a sphere, for example. So sphere is a very simple object in many ways because from any angle that we look at it, it, it looks the same, right? So what is the densest packing of, of spheres? And, um, and you don't have to go very far to figure out what the densest packing of sphere is. In fact, you can walk into any grocery store and you will see what the densest packing of spheres is, which is the, sim the, the familiar sort of orange stacking that is shown here. So as far as um, 1611, Johannes Kepler, the famous mathematician and astronomer, conjectured, that is, he made a mathematical hypothesis saying that the familiar orange stacking is the densest way to pack spheres in space. But Kepler was not lucky enough. He didn't live long enough to see whether he was right or not because it took, it took another 400 years for Tom Hales to actually prove that this was the case. Here's an image of Tom Hales with the same sphere packing that you see in, in Kepler's notes here. So my point here is, 
that packing problems may be very easy to grasp, easy to, to, to present, to, to formulate, but they're actually, and oftentimes they're very uh, intuitive. Like we know the correct answer is very intuitive, just like the oranges, we do this empirically, right? But they're very hard to prove mathematically. And this is why in my talk, when I talk about my research, what we did is we, we used computer simulations and mathematics to tackle this problem. So let's go back to the image that I was showing you before. There is something really disturbing about this image, and that is that most of these objects are not spherical. And if you look around you, most of the objects around us are not, in fact, spherical. So what do we do? So you might think, OK, well, it took 400 years to prove that spheres have this pa densest packing, which was so intuitive to all of us. Um, what hope do we have with no figuring out the packing of anything else, right? And maybe that is partly correct, but um, so what we want to do is we want to actually try to study packing systematically as a function of shape. So how does packing change when, uh, when the shape of the object changes? And here I'm showing you an image where uh, you have a, a round watermelon, and this is the stacking, the same as the oranges, the same one that Kepler conjectured and Hills proved a few years ago. Japanese uh, scientists have actually made square cubic watermelons to pack them better and so that they don't roll when you try to cut them. But between this inefficient spherical packing and the cubic packing, which is very efficient, of course, we all know this because cubes fill space completely. That's why we use cubic boxes, because they don't have voids, whereas here you see that you, we leave these voids between the spheres. And mathematically, we can interpolate between systems and look at what happens in between. And this is what I'm going to talk about today. So we are going to change shape and study packing. And what I'm going to look at are polyhedra. So polyhedra are objects like this one. So this is a tetrahedron. It's shown up there in the slide. It has four triangular faces. So polyhedra are shapes that, um, that have flat faces and, and these corners and these sharp edges that connect the corners. And that's all you need to know for today. But what is important, the reason why we're looking at these shapes is because um, in, in nanomaterials, nanoparticles naturally grow in polyhedral shapes. And that is why we're, we start with those. But this could be extended to any kind of shape that you might imagine. Um, so what can, we do to, what can we do with tetrahedra? So let's say, how can we deform the shape to study packing, how packing changes as a function of shape? So I said that, I mentioned that one of the characteristics is that it, the tetrahedron has these corners here. So what if we start snipping off the corners gradually, more and more and more and more, what will happen? So what happens is that, oh, this is an image of a nano tetrahedron. So if we snip off the corners, what happens is that we, we snip more and more and more um, gradually, and we create these new faces, and we end up with an octahedron. Now, an octahedron has eight faces. Um, it is pretty much, if you're familiar with this octahedral dice, this is what it looks like. And it's also like the, the like a pyramid is like half of an octahedron. Another thing that we can do to this shape is, like I said, the, the corners that we just snipped off uh, are connected by, by these, through these edges. And what if we start shaving off these edges? What do we get? So if we start shaving off the edges of a tetrahedron, eventually, and believe me, and you can see it perhaps in this image there, you will end up with a cube, which sounds crazy, but look at how it happens gradually, right? And of course, we can make a table where we have all the images in between, all the shapes in between. And this is what we use in order to, to study packing. And in fact, I'm showing you here only a grid of five by five. But in fact, we did more than 15,000 uh, polyhedra uh, on this table and in order to really uh, understand packing as a function of shape. All right. So let's say we choose three shapes. This is just an example. And what do we do? I mentioned that we do computer simulations. So I take a bunch of each of these shapes each of the 15,000 that I just mentioned. Um, and I put them in a box, in a simulation box, so that's a virtual box. And I let them jiggle about, so this is a bit like shaking. So they jiggle about and I squeeze the box as much as I can in order to find what is the densest way that these particles can, that these shapes can pack in space. And I write down what the density is. So the packings look a bit like this, right? And I write down the density, and you see here that uh, the, the density here, I say 0 0.9, that means that it, 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 it um, fills space 90%. There is a 10% that is, that is void. 
This one fills space better. This one, you see, it, it's almost like a cube. So for a cube, this would be 100%. It would be one. But because we have snipped off the, the, the corners a little bit, there are some voids. And so it's 98%. So it's not completely efficient, but it's better than the others. OK, so now we're, we're, we're scientists. So we want to make a graph. And uh, <laughs> we want to plot these results. So I have the table of my shapes here that I'm showing you. These are the three shapes that I just mentioned before. And we add another axis. That is, uh, that is a packing density. And up here is, is one. And so if I do this, and if I put a point for each, um, for my packing density, uh, for each shape that I have simulated, what I get is this, is this surface that you see here. If I rotate it, you see it's the alien spider surface that I was showing in the beginning. But the point here is that we have these, um, so the height of this surface means is, is the packing density, the value. And these solid lines indicate different arrangements in packing. And the reason why, uh, what I want you to notice is that there are, it, there are regions on this surface that look very smooth. And there are regions on this surface that look much more corrugated, highly corrugated. And why is this important? This is important because it means it tells us how sensitive our packing is, our packing arrangement that we have in here, how sensitive it is to changes in shape. So if you are sitting on a highly corrugated region of, of space here, and you're an experimentalist, and you want to assemble a tetrahedron, well, good luck to you, because real objects are never perfect. So any small deformation in your shape is going to give you very different packing densities and very different packings. Whereas if you want, if you are in the region around here, around the cube, you see that small deformations in shape don't make such a huge difference. The surface is much more smooth. And so I want to leave you with, with one thought, which is that for collective phenomena, such as packing, um, it is very important to no longer think of shape as a single object like this. Right? Shape is one point in a higher dimensional shape space where everything needs to be taken into account. All the shapes uh, around this one shape need to be taken into account in order to understand the system better. So, and with this, thank you very much. Uh, for your attention, I will leave it at that.